Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, it is my pleasure. Uh, my name is Leon Geshwin. I am the uh, Inouye Regional Center Education and Outreach Specialist at NOAA, and it is my great pleasure to introduce John Bravender, who is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist over at the Central Pacific Hurricane Center, and I'll let him go ahead and take it away. Go ahead, John. Great. Thanks, Leon. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, virtually or in, in person. Uh, imagine uh, after our, our near brush last hurricane season with Douglas passing just north of us, hurricanes might be a uh, you know, sensitive topic. Like, I don't want to deal with that. So if you're here, I'm, I'm glad you are. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk a little bit about uh, hurricane season, what affects it, especially from a, a, a climate standpoint. But before we get into that, I wanted to talk a little bit about what you know, what is a hurricane? What is a tropical storm? What those different things mean? And they're all names for tropical cyclones that based on their wind speed. Uh, here on the screen, tropical depression, tropical storm, hurricane, or, or major hurricane in category three or greater are all defined based on the wind speed. Uh, this image here on the left uh, is from 2014 when you had a little bit of everything going across the Pacific Basin. Uh, been around, maybe you remember uh, Isel hitting the Big Island as a, a high end tropical storm, causing a lot of damage there along the Puna and Kau sections. Uh, at this point in this image, it was a hurricane in, in to the east of the state. We also have tropical storm Julio. It eventually uh, strengthened to a hurricane, ended up turning north of us, didn't impact the islands, but it was a second threat that we were worried about. And also on to the left, uh, tropical depression Genevieve. It's the, the weaker end of the spectrum uh, on the scale here, but it as it moved into the Western Pacific in, in this event, uh, eventually stupid, it strengthened into a super typhoon and uh, you know, got, got very strong as it moved uh, into the Western Pacific Basin. So what do we need to get a hurricane to form? You can see the ingredients listed on the, on the right here and the graphic on the left is a lot of historical tracks from, from 1970 to 2016. So you can ask yourself, where do all these come together? You, you need warm water, you need low wind shear. Uh, well, the, the closer to the equator you are, the warmer the water is, but you can't be right on the equator. The hurricanes spin and they need a little bit of rotation uh, in order to uh, start spinning around and form uh, a tropical cyclone that will be persistent, you know, st stay around for a long time. And that happens, you're, you're looking at least five, maybe up to 10 degrees away from the equator as a, a, a minimum for getting the influence from the Coriolis effect. You've heard that term. Uh, it's what causes hurricanes to spin uh, counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. So where all these come together, uh, here, south of the state, uh, we have, normally over Hawaii, we have a lot of wind shear. We have trade winds at the surface blowing from the northeast, winds high up in the atmosphere blowing from the southwest. Winds blowing from the different directions like that cause thunderstorms to till. They don't stay upright. And to get a, an organized, strong hurricane, you need very low wind shear. You need it very upright. And having wind shear over us keeps Hawaii uh, it's uh, not as we're, we're not as uh, prone to seeing hurricanes uh, through in part because of the the wind shear and also because the waters near us are a little bit cooler. You can see these tracks passing south of us where the wind shear is on average a little bit less. But you might also notice in the eastern Pacific, there's a lot more activity than we see in the central, and that's from a lot of a lot of hurricanes form in the east. Uh, what you need that that low level, the low level system, uh, some sort of low pressure spinning system that th thunderstorms can focus on. And then once the thunderstorms form, they develop thunderstorms release heat and that heat ends up causing the low to strengthen. It just feeds back on itself. You get the strengthening and there in the Eastern Pacific, you, you see a lot more of those features that they can focus on. A lot of the activity that we see in the Central Pacific is from the, the track shifting westward. So one thing we've noticed over the past you know, few decades, going back to the 1950s, looking decade by decade, is that as ocean temperatures are warming, these tracks are shifting 
poleward. They're shifting towards higher latitudes as the oceans get warmer. And we've seen, I say poleward because we've seen this across the globe. Northern hemisphere, they shift northward. And in the southern hemisphere, they're starting to shift southward. So that's uh, not a good sign for us in Hawaii. Rather than passing south of us, we might see more tropical activity moving in from the east. So question, uh, out of all these ingredients listed here, which of them is you really has the biggest impact on what we define as hurricane season? And if you have any answers, uh, type it in the chat box. Pause here for a few minutes. And I'll just talk it through for you as well as we're going through this. You know, some things don't change. You know, distance from the equator doesn't change. Uh, you know, wind shear does a little bit, but not too much. And answer is the water. Water is warmer during the summertime and into the fall. And that's one of the ingredients. Warm water is what provides the fuel for hurricanes. And we see more activity during the summertime uh, because of the warmer water that we have in the oceans. So what is, when is hurricane season? And I was looking for an excuse to use this video, so I threw it in here. Now, uh, while you're thinking about that question, when is hurricane season, uh, you can take a look at this video. It was taken by one of our hurricane hunters flying through the eye of a hurricane. Hurricanes, very strong, very powerful storms, lots of thunderstorms with them. But in the center, because of the spinning, all the thunderstorms are get spinning fast enough. Thunderstorms pushed out. You have the sinking air in the middle. You, have, you form this eye that, as you can see here, can be clear. There could be nothing in it, no clouds. As we pan up, we see blue sky, pan down to the ocean. You see cloud free there, blue sky above. Pretty amazing thing, flying through the eye of a hurricane. So when is hurricane season? It is June to November, June 1st through November 30th. And we're looking at the Central Pacific, uh, which is between 140 West and the International Dateline. And each of these bars is a, one of those days. This is how much activity we normally see. So hurricane season runs from June to November, but uh, it takes a little while to ramp up. It's still a little cool in June. Uh, end of July, especially into the first part of September is where we see the most activity. And then it starts to taper off. And one of those things that reason it tapers off uh, slower on the back end is some of the influences we have from other large scale processes that we'll talk about in a little bit, such as El Nino and so El Nino Southern Oscillation. So we're fo this graph shows hurricane season, June to November, but we, we still can have hurricanes throughout the year. Uh, we, we saw that just recently in 20, our 2015 season was really big, really active. And we even had Hurricane Polly that formed in January of 2016. So you can have years like that, have hurricanes form any time of the year. And you can see the scattered a little bit out of, uh, out of the normal season. But when we talk about, especially for threats to Hawaii uh, in particular, we're looking at the, the main part of hurricane season during the summertime and into the fall. So that's the seat, you know, that's these graphs we're, we're showing day to day uh, changes, variability. But what does it look like year to year? Last year we had two, and they couldn't have been different, more different. We had Boris that came across 140 as a depression, it weakened and dissipated right away. And then Hurricane Douglas came across as a major hurricane, only gradually weakened, passed north of the stage of the hurricane passed within 30 miles of the islands. Uh, very close call, very near miss with Douglas. So we had two, one could have been a big impact, one wasn't close to that. Let's see, uh, in past years, 2019, actually uh, a little note too here about uh, what we're looking at. Uh, on the, the map, all the colors mean it's based on their intensity and that's what the scale on the right shows. Major hurricanes in purple, hurricane in red, Tropical storm in yellow, tropical depression in green. So 20, 2019, we had four. Maybe you, maybe you remember Hurricane Eric passing south of us and Flossie coming in from the east again and weakening before it reached us. 2018, oh, this was a crazy year. We had six, so a little above, uh, above average for us. Average hurricane season is four to five uh, during the season. We had six, there were all hurricanes in the basin. 
Remember Hurricane Lane approaching from the south. Uh, Tropical Storm Olivia made landfall across Maui twice. It hit Maui and it hit Lanai. Um, 2018 was interesting too, in that uh, before this year, the last time we had a Category 5 hurricane, the, the strongest on the Saffir Simpson scale, was in 2006 with Hurricane EOK. In uh, 2018, we had two. Lane reached a Category 5 strength as it was approaching south of the state. And then Hurricane Wallaka, uh, later in the year, as it was uh, going by Johnson Atoll and up towards the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, also was a hurricane or a Category 5 hurricane uh, for, for a period of time as well. 2017, again, hardly at anything this year. We had two, Fernanda and Greg, early in the year, and then nothing after that. Uh, 2016, that was another impactful year with Darby making landfall and Madeline and Lester doing a couple near misses. Uh, 2015 was our crazy year, record setting year. We had 15 tropical cyclones during hurricane season, 16 for the calendar year. So, so when we look at this, there's a lot of variability from year to year. And you can see that kind of this graph here, there's some years we have a lot of activity, some years very little, sometimes none. It averages out to just about four to five. So you hear 4.7 is the actual number. So we say four to five. So what causes all that variability? So here's another question. What is the biggest influence on how busy our hurricane season may be? And there's a correlation here too. When the Pacific is busy, the Atlantic is quiet. When the Atlantic is busy, the Pacific is quiet. So look at last year, for example, Atlantic Basin, record setting year across the board, number of storms, uh, intensity, uh, landfalls. We were very quiet, we had two. So what was the, so, so I'm saying there, there's a, a large scale pattern coming into play here. And that is El Nino La Nina, also known as El Enso, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. During El Nino years, which we'll talk about just in a moment, the Pacific is busy and the Atlantic is quiet. And during the cold phase, La Nina years, the Pacific is quiet and the Atlantic is busy. So what do I, so what causes El Nino, what does that mean? So here are two images showing quintessential cases. On the left, La Nina, the, the cold phase of the oscillation from 1998, 1988, showing colder than normal water along the equator. And the case on the right from 1997, uh, the warm phase, El Nino, showing above average temperature along the equator. And these images are showing anomalies. The, whatever the temperature of the ocean is, minus the average. And we're, the, the boxes on the lower right part of the image show different areas that we look at. This Nino 3.4 area from about 120 west to 170 west is the, the one that we mainly look at to determine whether we're warm or cold. During, uh, during the warm phase, during El Nino, trade winds are weaker. There's not as much westerly wind near the equator, uh, not as much easterly wind near the equator. You get more westerly wind, and that causes the, the warm water to pile up in the eastern half of the Pacific and causes uh, uh, the, the warming that you see here on the right image. Normally, the, we have trade winds blowing from east to west, blowing across the Pacific, and shifting all as the water heats up near the equator, shifting it westward, and you get upwelling, you get colder water coming up along the coast of South America. And uh, when during El Nino years, that upwelling shuts off, it stays above normal. And during La Nina years, the cold phase, this trades are stronger, everything's shifted farther west, and the water's colder than normal. So that's where our big impact comes into play during hurricane season. So if we go back to that other graph, color coding the years by what we've seen uh, you know, during, as far as the ENSO phase, the warm years in red, uh, they, they stand out. 2015 was definitely a, a, a warm year. Uh, the example that we show for the graphic was uh, 1997, you know, or, or going, coming out of 1997. Uh, 
It's a warm year, 92, 82 other big years. And then, uh, for example, last year we were lining in cold trays and we only had two. So we factor this into our uh, hurricane season outlooks. This is our outlook that we put out last May. Uh, at, the, at the time we were and so neutral, we we're in between those two phases and, and expecting it to go cold, which it did. So our rain, we we're expecting near to below normal activity in the basin. And as you saw, we ended up getting two. But the big thing here that we always try to emphasize with these outlooks is that it's an outlook for the whole basin and doesn't address the potential impacts to Hawaii. And we saw that last year. Sure, we had two, but uh, one of those was Hurricane Douglas passing just north of us. And this is a, a radar loop from the, our weather radars across the state. Uh, showing just how close the eye of Hurricane Douglas was passing north of us. So we escaped, narrowly escaped an impact from that. And with that, I'll pause and see if anybody else or if anybody has any questions. Thanks, John. Are there any questions uh, in the chat? Or, or over at the museum? Yeah. Does climate change have an impact on hurricanes? Yes. Um, <laughs> well, there, there's a few different uh, impacts. There's the impacts that we see. I, I mentioned one of the impacts we've seen is that with, with warmer oceans, the, the tracks are shifting towards the north and the northern hemisphere and towards the south and the southern hemisphere as the oceans get warmer. Another impact, uh, well, hurricanes get their strength from the warm water in the ocean. And the warmer the, the water, the more heat and energy is available to allow them to strengthen. Now, going forward, climate, some of our climate models show a couple different things that could happen. One with warmer oceans, it says you could have just more activity across the board. Uh, other, other simulations show that you could have uh, not necessarily more hurricanes, just stronger, more destructive ones. So either way, we need to uh, be aware of that threat and prepare and keep the uh, make make sure we're ready for potentially more and more dangerous impacts as we move forward. John, I had a question too. You mentioned that um, that Douglas was only 30 miles from uh, from Hawaii. What what is that measuring to? Is it the center of the eye? Oh, that's right. Yeah, as uh, yeah, as I was as I was passing north of us, uh, we were looking at the wind field, and uh, the the radar is actually at this point looking a little bit up, so there's a, some tilt to it. But yeah, look, look into the, the the center point of Douglas, uh, and I, because it was, I don't know if you remember Douglas, it was moving very fast, so there wasn't a big wind field on the south side of it. it. It was moving one direction, the winds were blowing the other way, so we didn't see as much impacts on the south side. The more dangerous side of a hurricane is actually just to the right of track, right front quadrant, well north of us at this point, uh, is, is where you have strongest winds, most storm surge, and the most impacts from it. Hey, John, maybe there's one final question in the chat. Um, Nathan's wondering if we're still in a La Nina right now. Yep, we are still in La Nina right now. It, is start, it has started to weaken. Uh, it's not as cold as it was initially. And the the current ENSO forecast has it maybe becoming neutral by next year. Uh, the, the, the ENSO forecast, especially this time of year, are difficult. There's something called a, a spring predictability barrier that makes it hard for us to know what's going to happen after the change in the season. So as we get uh, over the next few months, we'll get a better idea of what will happen about that. But right now it looks like there's it's expected to weaken gradually, but for next summer, equal chances, maybe neutral, maybe still cold. Uh, 
doesn't necessarily look like there is a, a large chance of switching over to El Nino, which in terms for impacts for us for hurricane season is, is welcome. Any last questions for John over at the museum or online? Sorry. I... Go ahead. Uh, I don't think there's anything else. Yeah, nothing else over on this side. Okay. If there aren't any other questions, let's uh, give John a big virtual round of applause and thank you for coming. And just to let everyone know, our final talk of the day is going to be uh, Dr. Nathan Becker and Cindy Preller will be talking about tsunamis and the Japan 2011 tsunami and the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center's response to it. So we'll start that up at 1.30. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us. Stick around. Definitely want to hear the tsunami talk.